Okay. So good evening, everyone. Whoever is watching our special live streaming broadcast, I should say, the official YouTube channel of Regional Science Center Opal, which is a unit of National Council of Science Museum. For you all, I would like to introduce on this very special occasion, the World Science Day we are celebrating, or also this day was declared long back for a few years back uh, by the UNESCO in collaboration with different science museum network, International Science Center, Science Museum Day also. So we have a wonderful opportunity to hear today one of the very inspiring figure in the field of science, especially in, field, in the field of physics and astrophysics and astronautics. He is a planetary scientist. So I will definitely introduce about today's speaker. Before that, I would like to mention why we are organizing this talk. So whoever is watching uh, this feed live program on our YouTube channel or our science centers networks on different platforms. So I would request you all to please ask your question to our YouTube channel's live feed if you have with your name, class, name of your students, uh, school, and also your question. At the end of the talk, with kind permission from the ma'am, we will take a few questions, which are very important according to Einstein, questioning is very central part of scientific understanding. So we'll take it. And uh, as we all know, 10th November across the planet, from 2002, people are celebrating as a part of celebration of science and technology and its development because the UN through UNESCO proclaimed this year as international year for science. So they call World Science Day, peace for peace and development. So very important, very important uh, context also, whatever science and technology is coming up, it's close in conjunction, everything should be for the peaceful use of science and technology for the sustainable planet in future. So definitely that is a very important aspect. And as we all know, this year it is declared as International Year of Bas uh, Basic Sciences for the Sustainable Development. On this great occasion, we at Regional Science Center of Bhopal realized we should organize some very important talk as far as front uh, cutting edge research is going on. When we approached Professor Sarah, though she is extremely busy in other commitments, as you can Google about her work and engagement on various platforms and conferences, it is very difficult to take her time. But immediately uh, she responded us and gave, gave us one important hour for today's program on this great occasion. So without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker before you all, but my request to you all, please enjoy the festivity of science. Don't miss and forget to visit your science center or planetarium, whoever is uh, living nearby in these uh, vicinities in our country or wherever you are watching this program, please, science centers are very important for your learning curve. We take pride to be a part of this very culture of learning science by doing. So on this occasion, on behalf of Regional Science Center Bhopal and also our parent body, National Council of Science Museums, which is a scientific body, non-profit autonomous body under the Ministry of Culture and Government of India. We take pride to introduce today's speaker, Professor Sarah Seeger. Professor Sarah is a planetary science and physics and aerospace engineering professor at MIT. MIT doesn't need any introduction. See, and you can see even her background, so many equations are there. So it is like any Hollywood film, something is going on, science fiction film, and ma'am is explaining to us. Fantastic uh, backdrop. So Professor Sarah Seeger is an astrophysicist physicist and a professor of physics, professor of planetary science, and a professor of aeronautics and astronautics. Very important from Indian perspective as well. Our ISRO is doing extraordinary well, commendable work. So aeronautics and astronautics at MIT, where she holds the class of 1941 professor chair. She has been a pioneer in the vast and unknown worlds of exoplanets, the planet which are orbiting other stars. I'm taking a few, uh, a minute or so, because introduction is very important to know about her work so that you can actually pose your question after the talk. Planets that orbit star other than the sun. Her groundbreaking research ranges from the detection of exoplanets, atmosphere, to innovative theories about life on the other worlds, to development of novel space mission concepts. In the space mission for planetary discovery and exploration, she was the deputy science director of MIT-led NASA Explorer class mission TESS. TESS is a well-known mission after Kepler for its contribution. She was also PI of JPL-MIT CubeSat Astria, uh, CubeSat, 
Astria is a lead of StarSat Rendezvous mission, a space-based direct imaging exoplanet discovery concept under technological development to find a true Earth analog orbiting sun-like star. Very important. All of us are waiting to know when our uh, scientists, astronomers, will detect planet like Earth in outer world. And uh, definitely, and was universe okay. The most recently, she has detected a the detected a missing concept study to find signs of life or life itself in the Venus atmosphere. That was very talk of the town story globally about the Venus discovery. And ma'am will talk about it or maybe touch upon it in this talk. And she's also PI of a small mission to Venus targeted for the launch in 2023. That means next year. And very important for a school audience and everyone who is very much interested to read about her work, her research and her uh, Mac author, Genuine Grant, and other accolades, including membership in the US National Academy of Sciences, the Stackler Prize in the Physical Sciences, the Medellin Premier Medal, and also been awarded one of the Canada's highest civilian honors, appointment as an officer of the Order of Canada. Fantastic, ma'am. Congratulations for this wonderful recognition. Professor Siga is also author. She has many commitments as, as an author, but very important one, which I want to quote here on the last, in that at the last of this uh, introduction, the smallest light in the universe, the smallest lights in the universe, colon, a memoir. She will definitely brief us about her work through this book at, and at the end of the talk. Without further ado, ma'am, you are cordially invited once again and the stage is yours. Please talk to our students. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. I'm really happy today to tell you about our planet Venus. And I think you all have seen Venus in the night sky. If you haven't, be sure to look out for it. I think right now we can't see it because it's behind the sun, but it's so bright in the night sky. Well, about two years ago, I was part of a team that made a shocking discovery in planetary science. I'm going to tell you about that discovery and it's partly about taking risks and innovation and how fresh thinking can lead to new things. Recording so, in progress. The story begins a very long time ago, billions of years ago, when a simple life form, cyanobacteria, a single celled bacteria, figured out something very clever. Now, even though you're, we live really far apart, I'm sure you still have mold. And sometimes if a fruit goes rotten, it's really, smells bad, well, that's bacteria, little um, life forms giving off gases. And when cyanobacteria figured out something clever, how to harness energy from the environment, known as photosynthesis, they also gave off a waste gas, in this case, oxygen. So think about all the plants and bacteria today that do photosynthesis. They give a waste gas oxygen, which fills our atmosphere to oh, quite a lot, actually. We humans need oxygen to breathe, and oxygen is in our atmosphere to 20% by volume. But if there was were no plants or bacteria, there would be no oxygen in our atmosphere. And astronomers have picked up on this idea. Believe it or not, 100 years ago, an astronomer thought about this idea that we have oxygen in our atmosphere, and it shouldn't be there. So the search for life beyond Earth, there's a big branch of science that works to think about gases that don't belong, that might be indicative of life. So I love to imagine that around a nearby star, there are planets with intelligent aliens. And they have the kind of telescopes we're hoping to build, and they're looking back at our star, the sun, and our planet Earth, and they will be suspicious there's life on our planet. And it won't be from big structures like the Great Wall of China or things like pollution or city lights, but crazy, it'll be because of oxygen, a gas that doesn't belong, that the aliens under, would, would under, the hypothetical aliens would understand chemistry and know that we shouldn't have oxygen in this atmosphere unless it's being continually produced because it's such a reactive gas. So two years ago, I was part of a team that found a gas on another planet, a gas that didn't belong, that might indicate life. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about that story and tell you how that story led us into a series of missions that 
will go to Venus to search for signs of life and life itself. So it's true there's oxygen that is made by life, but there are so many other gases made by life. And in fact, here's a little factoid for you that every gas in Earth's atmosphere, so if we could take an inventory of every gas in our atmosphere down to tiny, tiny levels, PPT, part per trillion, it turns out that pretty much every gas is made by life. Only most of these gases have a dominant source that's not life. So let's take ozone, for example. Uh, most of you know about the ozone hole. Well, some cells produce ozone. I think everyone knows we breathe out carbon dioxide. That's made by life. So although most sources have a dominant source other than life, it's crazy to me that life makes so many different gases. The one exception is the noble gases like helium and krypton. They don't interact much and life does not make those. So out of all these gases, my team has been studying what gases could we consider that might be a sign of life on an exoplanet, a planet orbiting a star other than the sun. And one of the first gases we came across is a gas called phosphine. Now, I know most people have not heard of phosphine, so I'm going to try to explain to you what, you know, what it is. Phosphine is a phosphorus atom that's indicated by this orange ball attached to three hydrogen atoms, PH3. And phosphorus, I think you will have come across that, at least in your biology class. It's an essential element for all life on Earth. You know, it's part of our DNA, literally. All life needs this. But on Earth, we find phosphorus not associated with hydrogen atoms, but it's associated with oxygen atoms in these compounds called phosphates. Because, you know, on Earth, we have almost no hydrogen, right? Like our atmosphere is filled with oxygen and nitrogen. We have very little hydrogen. And it turns out that the temperatures and pressures here on Earth, phosphine is very unfavored. Thermodynamically, it's nearly impossible for phosphine to get made. So it just doesn't exist here, except phosphine on Earth is only associated with life. It's found in wetlands and oxygen-free environments. It is found inside animal guts. And it's found um, in laboratory cultures, when people take bacteria from the environment and put it in the lab, they can measure phosphine coming off of it. So we were really excited about this. Um, this is how science evolves. It's like, here's a fascinating gas. It can't be made by like natural processes. It is only associated with life. And we were studying the potential of phosphine in terms of exoplanet atmospheres that one day with better telescopes, we might be able to find phosphine and we might be able to argue that it's a sign of life. Well, right when my team was in the middle of working on this, we learned about another team led by Professor Jane Greaves in Cardiff, United Kingdom. What's so unusual about this story is, I, I'm just wondering if any of you have heard of phosphine before. Well, most astronomers haven't heard of phosphine either. So it was very unusual that two astronomers separated by thousands of kilometers we're both working on phosphine. And Professor Jane Greaves did something very unusual in that she purposely wanted to search for signs of life on Venus. And I'm gonna come later to why that's such a crazy idea. And she did her research. She looked through the papers and the literature and she, like we did, found that phosphine on earth is only associated with life. And it turns out that phosphine has a rotational transition like it has a spectral feature at radio wavelengths where she's an expert astronomer. So she proposed to use this telescope. It's called the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope. It's in Hawaii on the top of a mountain. And here's a kind of awkward picture of it from the inside. It's like a big radio dish. And no one liked her idea. So when you want to use a telescope, you have to write a proposal. It's kind of like writing a lab report at school, but you have to argue why your idea is a good one and deserves to get some time on the telescope. And she was rejected a bunch of times before finally she succeeded. Now, because my team was also working on phosphine, someone connected our two teams and she invited us to help her work on the project. We helped her propose to use this other radio telescope array. This is in Chile, very high up at 17,000 feet where 
the atmosphere is very thin and there's very little water vapor and it's a great place to do astronomy. Here, there's a lot of different dishes. There are literally 60, 60 dishes that are, I think about 12 meters diameter and they all work together. So we worked hard for a number of years. Professor Jane Greaves worked for five years on this project and we came to a conclusion that we had found a sign of phosphine gas in the atmosphere of Venus. We made a big announcement and what we said was this, we report a detection of phosphine. We're not claiming there's life on Venus, but we literally wrote a hundred pages of investigation on what can make phosphine. Could it be made by volcanoes, lightning, meteorites hitting the atmosphere and delivering phosphorus compounds or other processes? And we couldn't find any. I mean, a lot of these make phosphine, but in tiny amounts too small to match even the tiny amounts that our observations found. So we made an announcement that we found phosphine on Venus and it's either due to unknown chemistry or possibly there could be life in the atmosphere. And how do you think the world took this? Like, do you think they were really excited about this possibility? Or do you think they were skeptical? Well, it turned out people were not only skeptical, but people got angry. And there's a whole psychology I don't understand at all, but they certainly had some legitimate complaints. Uh, let me see where I am here. Okay, here, I forgot to show you this. I just listed some of the things. You know, Venus actually has volcanoes, lots of volcanoes. People argue how active the volcanoes are, but they are actually giving off gases. So we worked through all this. We didn't find anything. And there's a lot of reasons why people don't like this result. And it's let's just say very controversial. I'm going to pick one reason to tell you because I wanted just to share with you that science is not always a simple process. Someone discovers something, other people are skeptical. It can go back and forth for years or even decades before it's resolved. So it, you can read this if you want, but I'm only gonna explain this one on the bottom that all the data from these big facilities it's typically taxpayer dollars that pay for the big telescope. So the data is all public. So you do your science and you make the data available to anyone who wants to see it. Well, other astronomers could then analyze the data. Okay, this is like you doing an experiment in chemistry class and you write up, you analyze the data and you get a result, but your lab mate gets a completely different answer. Some of the people looked at the data and they did not find a signal. And they claim there's no signal of phosphine or anything in the atmosphere. Other teams analyzed the data and did find a signal, but they wanted to claim it's not phosphine, it's another gas. And so this is how science works. It goes back and forth and we'll have to wait and see where this goes. However, there's one interesting fact, another interesting um, strong finding that people got motivated by this phosphine discovery to consider Venus again. And they looked at old data. In the 1970s and 1980s, NASA and the former Soviet Union sent well over a dozen missions to Venus. They went to Venus, they dropped through the atmosphere and made measurements directly. And one of those actually shows some signs of phosphine in the atmosphere. So this is highly controversial. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But I wanted to take a step back and explain why it's so crazy to think about life on Venus. So Venus has a massive carbon dioxide atmosphere. You know, here on earth, we have about 400 part per million carbon dioxide. Venus has 97% of its atmosphere is carbon dioxide and it has a massive atmosphere. So because of that, and Venus is closer to the sun than earth is, it's heated up so much that its surface is too hot for life of any kind. There's no plausible liquid that could exist on the surface and most molecules can't withstand the temperatures there. But just like on earth, if you hike up a mountain or you imagine pictures of a mountain, it gets colder. The higher you go above the surface, it gets colder and colder. And that happens on Venus as well. So, 50 kilometers above the surface in the atmosphere, Venus is the right temperature for life. So starting over half a century ago, Carl Sagan first put forward this idea that maybe there's life in Venus in the clouds. 
So this life could never go to the surface because it would just die there. But somehow it's in the clouds floating around and it's just there. Now Venus has permanent clouds. So unlike on Earth, the clouds come and go. On Venus, the clouds are 100% always there and they're very vertically extensive. And supporting this notion is that our own Earth, we have life in our clouds. There's bacteria from the surface that gets swept up and it, some of it go, a lot of it goes inside our cloud droplets and it stays there for like a week or so and can get transported across continental scales before being rained back down. So all of this, you know, I don't know if this sounds like a crazy idea to you or if it sounds legit, but the phosphine discovery, although it's still very controversial, it inspired people to jump back on this idea that there could be life in the clouds of Venus, whether or not phosphine is there. And that's pretty amazing, actually, because we want to know what is out there. And if there is life in the Venus atmosphere, it's not birds flying around or anything. It is bacteria. That's what we're thinking about, small single-celled life. However, the clouds of Venus are still a terrible place for life as we know it. There's very little water in the in the atmos in the air or the atmosphere of Venus. And in the droplets, they're not made of water like our clouds are, but they're made of a very nasty substance called sulfuric acid. It's way more acidic than anything you've ever seen before. You would never get this just like in a household cleaner. It's so bad it'll burn a hole in pretty much anything, including your skin, and stay away from it. It's incredibly dangerous. It's many orders of magnitude more acidic than the most acidic environments on earth where we find life. So if there is life in the atmosphere, it's going to be, I don't even know. I mean, it's so crazy. So this discovery of phosphine motivated a lot of people to get interested in Venus again. And what's fascinating to me is that when we, meaning like me and other people, went back to look at the missions that went to Venus four decades ago, found that there's a lot of mysteries that when people were working on the data, they didn't understand it and they just shelved it. Like they put it aside for all those many decades. So it's not just this idea that there might be phosphine in the atmosphere, but many other gases that don't belong. Remember I showed you the plot about how many, or the chart about how many gases are made by life on earth. Well, what if it's not just phosphine? What if it's ammonia? There have been tentative ammonia. There's all kinds of, we call them chemical anomalies. You could call them atmospheric mysteries on Venus. And we have tried to work with those to create a theory, if you will. So I now have a few slides that are more technical. And you don't have to understand the next few slides to understand the rest of the talk. So if you can't follow the next few slides, don't worry. I want to do my best to explain to you um, this kind of theory that my team came up with. So you can ignore this equation on the right, but it's describing photochemistry in the atmosphere, where when you have, I want you to imagine a volcano. Okay, let me explain the spot first. So this is the height in kilometers above the surface. And this is what we call the mixing ratio, or it's like the volume fraction of a gas. And I want you to focus on this green line. And this is a gas called sulfur dioxide. It comes out of volcanoes on Venus. So I want you to imagine the sulfur dioxide coming out of volcanoes. It floats through the atmosphere. It fills the atmosphere to quite a small amount, about one part in a thousand or so. And that's all good, except very high in the atmosphere, way above the clouds at about 80 or 90 kilometers above. Look, the sulfur dioxide starts breaking off, right? We start losing it because the photons from the sun, ultraviolet radiation sets, uh, destroys sulfur dioxide. So that's the basic picture. Gas comes out, it fills the atmosphere, and then it gets destroyed by ultraviolet radiation from our sun. Now I want you to look at that simple idea. And now these gray points with these uncertainties, these air bars, those are real measurements made by probes that went into the atmosphere of Venus four decades ago, or some ground-based measurements from here on Earth, people using telescopes to look at Venus. And the question for you is, does this green line match the data? Does this line fit the data points? Well, over here, it does, right? Like imagine you're a child and your job is to draw a line through the data. 
even a child could do better than this picture, right? Because it fits the data here, but over here, so far off. You know, if I were to take this point, wow, this is like a thousand, it's 10, 100, you know, nearly a thousand times off. Wow, what's going on here? Well, it turns out people don't really know, actually. Like in science, there's a lot of questions and people don't know why is sulfur dioxide so depleted in the clouds. But motivated by the whole phosphine story, this researcher, whose name is Professor Paul Rimmer, came up with an idea. And he thought, he came up with this idea that if surface minerals are swept up from the surface by winds, and if they can reach the cloud particles, which is pretty hard because the clouds are 50 kilometers above the surface, and they get absorbed by the cloud droplets, these surface minerals act like a base and neutralize the acid and set off a chain of reactions that ends up dissolving some of the sulfur dioxide and now the model works better. So this dashed line, that would be like a child drawing a line through the points, is an artificial fix to the model. But this green line comes from Professor Paul Rimmer's model. If he assumes that the salts are being swept up from the surface and go inside the liquid sulfuric acid cloud droplets, they set off a chain of reactions that gets rid of the sulfur dioxide. That's a bit complicated, um, but my team said, well, what if it's not the surface salts? What if, let's take the crazy idea that there's life in the clouds making ammonia gas. There's ammonia tentatively detected by the former missions that went to Venus. That would do the same thing. It would get absorbed by the droplets. It would set off a chain of reactions. And I want you to know that this kind of model there's a lot of details behind here that I can't share with you in the time we have. It actually solves a lot of the anomalies. And I call this Occam's razor or conjunction fallacy, where we use in science this term Occam's razor to say, you know what? If there's a complicated problem, most often, usually, the simplest solution is the right one. But I have this other phrase I like called conjunction fallacy, which is our human tendency to not to make things up, but to explain a bunch of unusual things all together where there may be a good explanation for each one individually. So I'm gonna wrap up this kind of more complicated part of my talk by saying that there's a list of what we call atmosphere anomalies, a little bit of ammonia that's tentatively been discovered. There's this major depletion of not just sulfur dioxide, but water vapor in the cloud layers of Venus. We've me they've measured tiny amounts of oxygen. And finally, some of these cloud droplets, they're actually not spheres. They can't be pure liquid sulfuric acid. They have to be more interesting. So this hypothesis where we make a hypothesis that perhaps there's life-making ammonia, we solve every one of those anomalies. Now that's just for you to see like a little glimpse of science. But I want to tell you something that's actually even more interesting now. So these cloud droplets, none of our life could ever survive in the cloud droplets. And I gave you one um, kind of brief like glimpse of a model that helps to argue that, you know, if there is, oh, I forgot to say one important thing that, you know, in our stomachs are very acidic. There is bacteria that makes ammonia and that ammonia neutralizes the acid so the bacteria can survive. And this kind of idea of ammonia, um, it would be amazing if it's happening, just like in our stomachs, there's some bacteria that's giving off ammonia to make the acid more livable. But let's put that idea aside for a moment. And I want to tell you about some new work going on in the about the cloud particles. And this is work being done here on earth in laboratory. And this sulfuric acid, you know, the kind of understanding is that it's very, very bad for any earth life. And furthermore, that it is sterile to any interesting chemistry. But some of our colleagues, Steve Benner and Jan Spacek, they put a small organic molecule into a sulfuric acid droplet. And instead of being completely destroyed, this small organic molecule reacted and it ended up creating a rich organic chemistry. And that is, wow, eye popping. People in planetary science didn't know about this, but it turns out that in the oil industry, people have already known that they use concentrated sulfuric acid to 
take crude oil and make it into plastics and other materials. And they also know that sulfuric acid is good in that way because it can lead to a rich organic chemistry. We also motivated our colleague, Daniel Dusevich to, um, okay, actually I'm gonna skip that. So what can we do about all this? This idea about phosphine or ammonia or oxygen or the cloud particles maybe having life. Well, we can go to Venus. And I'm part of a, I'm leading a science team and science instrument to go with a company called Rocket Lab. And we aim to send our first mission to Venus in May of 2023. We have a backup date of January, 2025. And what this is, is there's a, there'll be a rocket that launches from New Zealand where Rocket Lab has their launch facility. And this rocket in the top of the rocket would be a small spacecraft called Photon. And this Photon, would be a cruise vehicle that will travel to Venus. It'll take about four or five months. And once at Venus, it'll drop off this little probe. Looks a bit like a UFO, oddly enough. But this probe will go hurtling down through the Venus atmosphere. And this is what we call a relatively cheap mission. There's no parachute. It's just going to take one hour to get from the top to like crash land at the surface. And we will spend five minutes in the cloud layer where we will make measurements of the cloud particles. And now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this mission. So we have our target launch and backup launch date. Our payload, our instrument is only one kilogram, which is tiny, but this whole mission is actually very small. We'll last for five minutes in the cloud layers. And you know what our goal is? Our main goal is we want to search for organic molecules in the cloud particles. We want to know whether or not these sulfuric acid droplets are super boring and have nothing of interest, or if what we suspect, there's a rich chemistry. So we were not looking for life on this, this first try because we just have one instrument, it's straightforward, but all life needs organic chemistry. And if we find there's some rich chemistry, we know that we can continue our search and there's hope that we can find something more interesting. So what are we looking for? We're looking for fluorescence. And I put this picture of this young man here to remind you what fluorescence is. Um, in this case, he's getting an eye test. See, his, core, his eyes are lit up green from droplets that were put in his eyes that fluoresce. But you can also see his mask, especially these white threads. See his t-shirt lighting up? And this is the doctor holding a black light. But I'm hoping that you've all seen something like this. Either um, somewhere you've been to like a dark room, maybe at a museum where there are fluorescing minerals or maybe the Exploratorium there has one. But this fluorescence is when you send an ultraviolet light and it, it, it knocks an electron up an energy level. And then the electron cascades back down emitting a photon. And on the right here, we're showing you a plot of laboratory-based studies where there's an excitation wavelength. So like a laser or LED, at different values. And on the bottom, it's showing you where those particles um, emitted radiation. And these are different organic molecules. Our goal in doing this was to be able to choose an instrument for our instrument that's going to space. We had to choose a wavelength of for the instrument. And so this helped guide our choice on, on what we're doing. Here's a graph showing you what our instrument will be doing, or it's showing you like the overall mission profile. So here we have, um, I want you to look at this axis. It's kilometers above the surface. And on the bottom, it's time in seconds from entry. And let's take a look at the black line here. So it gives you the parameters, like we'll enter the atmosphere or we'll enter the planet at 200 kilometers. That's where we're starting this graph. Going super fast, 11 kilometers a second. Think about that for a moment. And we'll be rushing down really fast. Our velocity is going to be initially like over 100 meters per second. And this probe will naturally slow down as it goes down. And this graph is showing us where the cloud layer is between 48 to 60 kilometers. And that's where we'll be taking data. Our probe will be shining a light through a window, or our instrument rather, shining a light through a window and measuring what comes back. And we're not just measuring the back, looking for fluorescence, but we're also measuring the backscattered polarized radiation. As the probe descends, it will take data 
and then it will send the data back directly to Earth, and it'll keep transmitting data. But the Venus atmosphere is very hot as you think about the atmosphere beneath the clouds. So eventually, it'll stop working. The electronics and everything won't work. So we'll send data back as long as we can until the temperature is too high for our instrument to work. And eventually, this probe will either implode due to the high pressures, or as you see on the bottom right over here, it will crash land at the surface. We're really excited to go back to Venus. We want to see what's in the atmosphere, and it should be amazing. Here's a little schematic just showing you what the probe looks like. Uh, it's just uh, not too big. It's about 40 centimeters across. Inside, there's this sphere, which is a pressure vessel. So everything in that pressure vessel stays at the pressures we have here on Earth. And there's like batteries, and there's our instrument just shown by this block. Um, there's insulation, and there are some other things. And we actually, um, this is, uh, if you really love Venus or want to learn more, we spent a couple of years thinking about all the ways we could go back to Venus and we could try to find signs of life on Venus. And we came up with um, three missions. One is that first one I told you about. And now um, for the rest of my talk, I will just tell you a bit about the other missions we have in mind. And these other missions, we don't have money for them yet. We don't have like a solid plan, but we're working on it. One of our missions, our next mission is sending a balloon to Venus. And what's so remarkable is that, uh, did you know we that our hu uh, humans on Earth have already sent balloons to Venus? In the late 1970s, the former Soviet Union sent two balloons to Venus. And these balloons, they came with all their own batteries and they lasted for two days. And the Venus atmosphere is pretty crazy because it has very strong winds and they whip around the planet in just a few days. Well, it's amazing to think that we sent balloons to Venus back then and we're trying to do that again someday. So this is like a schematic just showing you what happens. So there'll be an entry system where everything's all packaged together and that will be dropped into the Venus atmosphere. And it has to have a parachute to slow it down. And while it's being slowed down, this entry system releases the balloon. And the parachute that slowed the entry vehicle down gets jettisoned. The heat shield gets thrown off and out pops um, the balloon, which has this complicated inflation system shown here where it has its own parachute. It has a gondola here, and then that balloon inflates. But what's so scary, if you will, about this is, you know, the thing is dropping rapidly and it has to finish its inflation before it's too late. So this thing inflates and here's just a picture of the balloon. It's going to last for a couple of weeks and take measurements of the Venus atmosphere. <coughs> we want to, um, okay, this is a bit dry, but okay, we'll skip that. So what we'd like to do in the more distant future, and this is definitely a dream, but imagine if we go to Venus, we find fluorescence, and then we're able to send a medium-sized mission there to search for gases, like confirm the presence of phosphine and ammonia and all these other gases that don't belong. And imagine if we can send a special chemistry instrument that can tell us what molecules are present in the clouds. And if everything checks out that there's very complex molecules, there's the gases that don't belong, we hope that someday either we, or maybe it's you, send a mission to Venus to bring a sample back, to bring the cloud particles back to Earth so we can study them in detail in our laboratories. Now, if you're a space fan, you already know about Mars and NASA's planned sample return. And so this mission, you know, will rely on others figuring out some of the complicated things. But I just want to now outline for you how um, interesting this mission would be. It's a similar picture to before where we have an entry system that will entry and decelerate where our initial parachute gets jettisoned and sent off. The balloon system is released. And this balloon, you know, it's not to scale, but this has to be a giant balloon, like 30 meters in diameter. And attached to the bottom is not just an instrument, but is a rocket. And this rocket has to be a few hundred kilograms. We're not going down to the surface in this mission concept. It's just to collect the cloud particles and some gas from the atmosphere. 
And once everything is collected and stored inside the rocket, this rocket attached to the balloon has to point very precisely in this huge windy environment on Venus. And we'll let the balloon float up because the higher it is, the easier it is for the rocket to launch. And this rocket, we call it Venus Ascent Vehicle, will get launched and it'll have to go on an extremely precise trajectory to attach to an orbiting spacecraft. And that will lock together and this orbiter will be able to come back to Earth to bring the sample back. Now, some of you know the Japanese have returned samples from an asteroid. And in the USA, we've returned uh, stardust. We've returned particles from a comet. So people have returned samples to Earth. But there's obviously a lot of really hard problems here, connecting with that orbiter, a rocket on a balloon. But each one of these crazy hard concepts is already being pushed forward. Like here on earth, there's a company, they call themselves Raccoon, like the word rocket match with balloon. And on earth, these folks are trying to launch rockets from balloons. And there's a history of all of these ideas of going to Venus to bring samples back, of launching rockets from balloon. Every one of these ideas, it traces back years or decades actually. So we're just trying to bring all these ideas together so that we can go to Venus and try to find signs of life there. Um, okay, I might just tell you two other things, a little more detail, but how do we collect particles? That's really hard. Can you imagine just automatically collecting things? Well, we have two ideas. One is for solids, one is for liquid. This solid particle, it involves, do you know what tape, like scotch tape, how it's so sticky? If you're trying to tape something together, it just collects particles, right? Well, that's the idea is to have a spool where we're just spooling and we're sending particles down to the sticky tape. And the sticky tape then just winds back in on itself so that it's able to be stored to return to Earth. And we're working with a company called Honeybee Robotics, and they're designing this for us. And this tape is made out of gold. Everything has to be resistant to sulfuric acid. And this tape is very expensive, by the way. <laughs> but it's just that I just want you to know it's like a simple idea um, made into an engineering model. For liquid particles, we're trying out a fog harp concept. You know how if you go out in the rain and like you get wet, you know, or the fog and particles cling to you, this is called a passive fog harp collector. And people in, um, we've seen some of these, if you Google this up later, there's some places where people have a giant fog harp here on earth to collect water. But this would be a small fog harp and it would have wire tubes a uh, wire strings where the cloud particles will con con collect on. And by gravity, they will fall down into this little funnel here and they will go down into a vial to be collected. All of this has to be able to work in a sulfuric acid environment. Now I'm gonna summarize. Venus has many longstanding mysteries. Some of them have been directly measured by in the atmosphere by the probes from nearly 40 years ago. Some of the ones I mentioned were the possible presence of ammonia, this major depletion of sulfur dioxide in the cloud layers. There's a tiny amount of oxygen. There's the controversial discovery as phosphine. And there's just some unusual cloud particles, which mean they can't be pure sulfuric acid. They have to be more interesting. This phosphine discovery, although it's controversial right now, it has motivated a flurry of new activity, revisit of old data, new models, and a fresh look at chemistry, especially the chemistry of the cloud droplets. I want you to know that it's not just my team that's interested in Venus, but over since the phosphine discovery, NASA has decided to send two missions to Venus. The European Space Agency has a planned mission to Venus and other countries, including India, ISRO, want to go back to Venus. So we're entering like a new golden era for Venus. And I'm sure that we will be able to find many exciting things. That concludes my talk. We have a lot of time for questions and thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Okay, so I'm about to talk about it. Yeah, I have one. Hello. Yeah. Ma'am, uh, 
I think she has, ma'am, can you hear us? I can, yes, I'm ready for some questions. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. We have so many questions from, I was only moderating that and I was trying to sort listing those questions so that, uh, can you, uh, yeah, ma'am ma knows uh, Sopnil. She has been doing a lot of talks across, and I think post uh, during pandemic, she must have uh, attended everything on digital platform only. So I hope uh, uh, after this wonderful talk, and I am glad that uh, now we are all sitting on planet Earth, and Venus is known as twin sister planet. And talking about Venus, so that's really fantastic. And in these days, in our night sky. Two more planets are easily visible in the evening times, Jupiter and Saturn. So it's a very interesting proposition for this wonderful talk. So we have questions, ma'am, uh, from different uh, schools also. Whoever is watching directly from their schools and different parts of our uh, city. And also one question from different parts of India. So I'll take one question. Uh, Srimai Patil, uh, the name of uh, uh, the person who is using the YouTube name. What are the main motives behind the Da Vinci mission? I don't know how it is relatable to you. What is retrograde yes. rotation? Why is it so special in the case of planet Venus? Well, the Da Vinci mission, like the other NASA and ESA missions, they have many different goals. And the Da Vinci mission will have an orbiter and it will drop a probe down through the atmosphere. And this probe will do a lot of things. It will not measure the cloud particles, but one of its main goals is to measure the isotopes of different gases to try to understand something about the evolution of the Venus atmosphere. Okay. Because some gases are lighter and they escape more easily. And da Vinci will try to help us understand what those gases are and learn something about the surface of the planet as well. Okay. Okay, ma'am. So one student, uh, Trisa Singh Pariha, uh, she is in ninth grade from Big York. Big Yori students, uh, Big Yori school. And she's from Pune. She is, Pune is one of the cities in uh, Maharashtra state of our country, uh, southern part, in the western side of our country. And uh, if, phosphine, if phosphine is rare, then where do you find phosphine on planet Earth? That's a great question. Phosphine is very rare. It's only made by life on Earth, as far as we know. We humans, we make phosphine as pesticide. And phosphine is also found in some wetlands. So I don't know if you can help me out here if there are wetlands nearby, but like swamp, a swamp mm -hmm. yeah. where there's no oxygen like deep inside. It is found over penguin colonies, like penguin poop, because it's inside animal guts. So lots of there. And yeah, those are the places it's found. Yeah. And you know, ma'am, we have uh, uh, many interesting questions. Uh, I'll take you a few minutes because those are very essential part for their ignition because they are very much, uh, you know, waiting for uh, listening you from their perspective. Okay. So first of all, one teacher, out of the curiosity, teacher is also now motivated, ma'am, a lot. And teacher from Arvindo School, uh, he's asking, I'm Rahul, faculty at Sri Arvindo School, Bhopal. We would like to know if we would be able to send a probe which can remain suspended in Venus atmosphere to analyze the life of sign. So how do you see it? Well, we definitely, many people want to repeat what the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union did and send a balloon to Venus. And these balloons would be suspended in the atmosphere. And they could last for days to weeks to even months. But in the atmosphere, it's not the best place to measure the sunlight coming from the sun because the clouds are so thick. Remember, they're like very vertically extensive. And it's kind of like a little bit dark in those clouds. So yes, people want to send a platform that remains in the atmosphere. But if you wanted to study the sun, you might want to be a bit higher up. Okay. So one more uh, question from uh, Bhopal City only. The student is Alice Ba from Carmel Convent School, uh, Senior Secondary School, Bhopal. Do different areas have different kinds of props? How do surface and atmosphere interact chemically? That's a great question. And yes. I'm not as familiar with the surface, so I probably can't answer that question. That's probably a question I'm not going to be able to answer. Okay, that's interesting thing. And as we all know, in scientific experimenting culture, Framing a good question for doing a research is also very important for 
going behind it. And but I can maybe I can maybe address one thing about the surface. And by the way, in science, it's not like in school where you're forced to learn everything. You know how if you're taking chemistry, they make you learn everything. Like I have the luxury now, I just learn what I want to. So it's kind of, I know everything about the atmosphere, but the surface, mm, I don't care as much about. However, I can tell you one interesting thing is that most of us think Venus had an ocean early on and that it lost the ocean as Venus got hotter and hotter. The ocean essentially boiled away. So there are surface minerals that can only form when water is present. And if we can find those minerals, we'll know for sure that Venus had an ocean. Okay, okay. And I think uh, they may they may be very, very much interested in knowing more about it. So one student, I can mention the name, uh, Tanishka Seth, grade 10 from World Way International School, Bhopal. When and how did Venus runaway green house effect occur? Very good question. And believe it or not, we do not have an exact number. Oh. Some people think the runaway happened 900 million years ago. Remember, we've been around for like four and a half billion years. So 900 million years ago, other people think it happened billions of years ago. Some scientists think it never happened in that Venus was always too hot and there was never a water ocean. So in science, we sometimes don't have an answer for you. And we're hoping Da Vinci and the other missions will help sort it out. Like, first of all, they've got to prove there used to be a water ocean before we can try to figure out. And, you know, one of the reasons we don't know is because the atmosphere acts like a blanket and it traps heat. We don't fully understand. You know how on Earth, sometimes we can't predict the weather? Like, you can't predict the weather next summer, right? If I said, what's the weather going to be next summer? You don't know. Well, it's very hard to predict the weather and the climate billions of years ago. And our computer models aren't really good enough to pinpoint the time of when this runaway happened. Great question. Okay. It looks like we have a question from the online people who yeah, are yeah. right. So both we are taking, uh, we will once again go back to YouTube, but right now we can take question from our own science centers. Yes, uh, the, this is, the student is eagerly waiting for her turn to ask yeah. a question, please. Please, please uh, tell your name and grade also because ma'am is having so much interesting stories to tell. Please mention your name and grade and your school name. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, I am uh, uh, the student of uh, Little Angel School. I wa want to ask a question that, uh, is there any time on Venus like uh, Earth, we are having 24 hours. So is there any time on Venus? Mm. Oh, is there time? Great. That's actually an amazing question. And well, Venus, it turns out, rotate. You know how our time, 24 hours, it's because Earth rotates one time in 24 hours. Yes, ma'am. Well, Venus, maybe you already know the answer. That's why you're asking. It rotates one time in about, I want to say, 230 days or something. So its time would be incredibly slow they would need to invent a new unit. Maybe they don't count in hours and minutes, but maybe they would, if you know, if we had to go to Venus and um, yeah, I was just checking what the rotation period, one day on Venus is 243 Earth days. So they wouldn't divide it into 24 hours. They would have to divide it maybe into 243 days. So the time there yeah, there's no time on Venus and you would each student actually could probably come up with a creative way to like think of what the clock would look like. Okay, okay so, man. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for joining. Uh, thank you for asking. Great question. Uh, yeah. So your your time is differing from planet to planet. So but man is And while we're waiting for the next question, yeah. what's even more interesting about Venus is one year, the time it takes to go around the sun on Venus is shorter than one day on Venus. Oh, I, I think that's a really, I think most of the students will like it. Hard to get your mind around, because here, one day is shorter than one year. Okay. But there, one day is longer than one year. So it's kind of a crazy planet. Crazy. Okay, thank you, ma'am, for mentioning. And this is a very inspiring thing also. They, 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 they are going to explore more about Venus very soon. And they may join your future the space mission as PhD students or higher or postdoc in, or postdoctoral fellow in future. We don't know. At, at well, the future... Everyone here might be working at ISRO and going to, you know, leading a mission or working on the engineering or the science of a mission to Venus right from India. 
yeah and we as i end up, as i know from uh, isro uh, people they are also planning i don't know officially it is not announced yet but we, isro is also having a plan to send a mission to venus in coming years so and everyone knows that isro went to mars so venus is right right capable you're right capable of going to venus thank you ma'am and another question yes ma'am uh, yes sir uh, uh, you can ask a question by mentioning your name and grade yeah Good morning, ma'am. My name is Sara Chaudhary from uh, School Sagar Public, and my question is that there is a big controversy going on between the potential life on Mars and Venus. According to you, what is the what which planet is uh, most habitable for humans and living beings on Earth? Oh, that's a tough one because it's like. We love all our children equally, and so we're going to love Mars and Venus the same. I think the tension is just because of money, right? Like it costs so much money to go to planets, we can't do everything. So I think the tension is everybody wants to go to their favorite planet. And I always think of Venus and Earth and Mars. I always think of it like I'm sure that some of you have this. I always call Venus. You know, Venus is our sister planet. There's always the one sibling who gets all the attention. I know some of you have this, and isn't there the one sibling who's always ignored? I was the one who was always ignored, by the way, because my sister was just so like happy and outgoing. <laughs> but I do feel like Mars gets all the attention, right? And Venus has been ignored for many decades. So I I really can only I like to believe that both planets have life. That on Venus it's in the clouds, and on Mars it's beneath the surface somewhere. Okay. And not just Venus and Mars, but maybe many other bodies. Uh, okay, just oh. one more question: That oh. does the rotation of the Venus affect anything on humans? Like you mean, if humans went to Venus, or yes, if uh, possibly there was life and we even went there, so will the rotation and the time limit will that be any effect? Like I personally don't think it will. You know, we do have people here who live in the Arctic. And it's dark there for six months, right? I mean, it can be pretty depressing for humans. And then in the summertime, like in Norway, and the, it's daytime for a very long time. So it would be like that on Venus. You'd have night for a long time, right? For hundred, for like night for half a year, and then day for half a year. But we already have that in different places on Earth, and there's still life there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for asking the question, ma'am. We have questions from our online platform also. So I'll take a few more minutes, ma'am. I understand your busy schedule. But ma'am, questions are also a very central part of their engagement. Before switch, 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 uh, switching to the YouTube uh, questions, I want to understand a bit about your work also, ma'am, about your book. So the, whoever is listening or watching this program, your latest book, can you talk about, about your book a bit? I can. My book is called The Smallest Lights in the Universe. It's a memoir. So in the book, I tell the story of my life from when I was a child until about now. And this book talks about the exploration of outer space, why we want to search, what we're looking for, but it also talks about the journey of inner space, because it's sort of more for adults, this book, than for children, but all of us are on our own personal journey, and we each have a hope and a desire of making the world a better place or of reaching out to others. And the book tries to weave those two things together to inspire hope and to tell the story about our search for other Earths. Okay. And, and part of the book too, by the way, it's like when you see a scientist, you often don't know they're also a normal person. Like I have kids, I have a dog, I go home, you know, I do dishes. <laughs> and so part of the book is just to sort of show that and tell the story. Ma'am, so one, uh, one thing I want to understand from you, which uh, situation or event motivated you to write a book? Well, I just had some events in my life just were so unusual, and I really wanted to write that down and communicate it to other people and just to share with people my own journey so that it can inspire hope. And also so that people know that you can believe in big things and you can dream big and try to reach your dreams. Thank you. On this very important occasion when we are celebrating the World Science Day and also International Science Center Science Museum Day, so ma'am, how do you see the role of science centers in creating an environment for vibrant learning and engaging culture of science and technology? How do you see, ma'am? 
Well, it's so important as a gathering place for people of all ages, right? Like children will get introduced to science there. Um, adults can come back again and again. Here, there's this one science center where they're making it appealing to 20 year olds, like young people by having like, um, like in, they're making it like a night out. So they'll have like laser show in the planetarium and they'll do other things like that. I think we live in an increasingly scientific and technological world. So these science centers play a really important role. Thank you, ma'am. And we'll take very quickly two, three questions from YouTube because uh, one student must be insisting her father. So one father is asking on behalf of uh, a student. Good morning, I am a Swapnil Tiwari, father of grade six student. What would be the typical atmospheric pressure through the Venus cloud if you could throw some light on that in relation to photon 2023 vision? Well, amazingly, in the clouds, the temperatures and pressures are the same that we have right here where we're sitting now. So oddly enough, um, the, in, the, in the clouds, it's the same temperature and pressure because Venus has a massive atmosphere. So at the surface of Venus, it's like a hundred times more pressure than we have where we are right now. Okay. And uh, one question from the coding K, uh, Mr. Konal, currently in the grade 11th, I have a question that since we know the gravity could bend the space and time mass, then are we ready for the time dilation which could happen on Venus? Not really, because the planets, they're not bending space and time very much. So we don't have to worry about that for Venus. Okay. And ma'am, as you know, whenever some space or astronomy talk is going on, people definitely ask about aliens. So somebody is asking about aliens on Venus. That actually, you may say something. Otherwise, yeah. Sure. Well, unfortunately, we all love alien. Everybody wants to meet an alien. That's for sure. But they're not going to be on Venus. We've, you know, had probes to Venus. There are orbiters. We don't see anything there. And the surface of Venus, it's too hot for life of any kind. There can't be anything complex on the surface. If there is life, it will be in the clouds. But the clouds, they have very little nutrient. You know, there, If there is life in the clouds, it can't be something complicated because we've been to the clouds, not us humans, but we've sent probes there. And there's just like, think about it on a daily basis, how much food you eat, how much energy you expend. There's not enough resources on Venus for complex life. So there's no aliens of any kind. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, we have many questions. One, one very interesting question from Sagar Public School a student. Can you please tell the planet, which planet is recently discovered? And I also want to add one thing, Ma'am, since you have exploring, you have been exploring a lot about exoplanets. So can you tell why planet like Earth is very essential? And I'm also asking from the point of view, we are thinking about seriously now. We are, United Nations also pushing all of us uh, for sustainable planet, planet on this planet Earth, what, why we should concern about sustainable planet and the safety of this planet and health and well-being on this planet. And you are talking about planet, Earth-like planet in our outer world. So how do you see these two things, man? Well, they definitely relate because we want to explore the universe and the galaxy and the solar system and the nearby stars, but we humans are very fragile. You know, we love to imagine living on Mars. Some people want to imagine living in the clouds of Venus in big inflatables. But the reality is we we won't be able to do that. And our own planet shows us how fragile we are, right? Like with hurricanes and fires and droughts, we we are really in trouble here on Earth. So I don't have any great answer for you, but it's definitely true that looking out makes us look in. Okay, ma'am. So ma'am, with your time limit, ma'am, can we take one more or two? Or sure, let's have one last question. Okay, okay, so I club uh, one is asking about uh, why balloon concept was not used, Jed Maniar was not used for the photon 2023 mission. Balloons are complicated. That whole thing has to inflate very rapidly in a short amount of time as it's falling down. And complexity equals cost. So we really hope to do a balloon mission soon or later, but we're doing the cheapest thing first. And sort of a kind of way to look at it is like, imagine throwing a rock at Venus. We're just literally sending a probe, dropping something down, and it doesn't have to be very sophisticated. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, I can understand there are many, many questions in our live chat box. So uh, we may say sorry at this moment because of time constraints also, but definitely we are very happy that you enjoy the talk and you engage yourself and you listen, ma'am, really, really thanking everyone from Regional Science Center and whoever is in the in our innovation hub, 
on their behalf of also i would like to say thank you so much everyone on the last but not least on this very important occasion we are once again thankful to ma'am for giving her quality of time in apart from your, her busy schedule and she is first time speaking to any institution in india and she has not she has not visited india so far so hopefully in future she will be a uh, she will be on visit to india as a part of tour or excursion and definitely see ma'am you are invited to visit regional science center bhopal so on behalf of regional science center bhopal which is a unit of national council of science museums we are once again thanking you for your quality of time and inspiring these younger kids and this talk will also be available in our youtube channel post live session so ma'am last what do you want to say while closing the session? I want to thank everyone for coming to my talk and for everyone's enthusiasm and questions. Thank you very much. And I'd like to wish you clear skies and an incredible journey of your own. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Have a nice day. Bye.